All right, we got seven, eight. All right, can everyone see us? Ashton, are we live now? Yep, you're live. Oh, cool. All right. Well, uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our uh, Every Other Month USHST All Hands uh, webinar. Uh, we're waiting for folks to, to join right now, so we'll pause momentarily as folks jump in. Yeah, we're growing nicely. We're up to past 45 now, 46. Okay. Trying to get my screen. Y'all able to see my screen? Yep, you're up. It's not transitioning. Hold on. There we go. Okay. There we go. All righty. Well, well, we'll press on here. Um, Again, hello all to the attendees. Uh, we appreciate you joining us uh, today. Um, as always, uh, our, our goals and our, our visions here are to help our helicopter community, helicopter industry, uh, improving our, our safety and risk management processes. And you know, we have our vision of uh, of zero fatal accidents. And, and you know, we we should. Here? What's that? Oh, Bill, sorry. Um, so we strive towards that vision of zero, and uh, we hope you all equally uh, uh, endeavor to, to do that as well in your own personal and uh, work, work lives. Uh, we'll uh, go to the next slide with our agenda. We've got a lot of great topics today. We're really excited for the presenters uh, that are going to be joining us. Uh, we appreciate their, their willingness to volunteer and, and provide provide such vital and important uh, topics to everybody. And uh, we hope you all enjoy that as well and uh, get a lot out of it uh, for today. Um, I will encourage everybody to, to go to the USHST website um, and check out uh, our uh, Unintended Flight and Instrument uh, Meteorological Conditions Safety Initiative. There's a lot of great resources there some online uh, classes that you can take and you know partnership with with HAI um, we hope that you you go there and uh, check it out James did you have any uh, any items that you want to bring up uh, no uh, other than welcome everybody yeah good morning James Sutherland from uh, well, the safety uh, program management uh, branch in the aircraft certification office with FA uh, I co-chair this uh, outreach group with uh, Chris Young, but like to probably uh, pop right into introductions so we can get to the first topics. Um, I'll start off with uh, Karen Gaddis from uh, uh, the FA uh, Flight Standards. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone. It looks like we have a full agenda today. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass the mic back. Thanks, James. All right. Thanks, Karen. And I'll hand it over to Nick uh, Mayhew. Uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name again, Nick. But no, you're good. Uh, for... <laughs> you're good. You're good, James. Good morning. Good afternoon to everybody. Nick Mayhew. I'm the uh, industry co-chair for the United States Helicopter Safety Team. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, All Hands webinar. Um, first of all, just thanks to uh, Chris and uh, James and his team for putting this on. It's no mean feat to get to uh, to get the pulleys together each, each every, every eight weeks or so. Um, um, but there are some good stuff coming your way, human factors, risk management. Um, and uh, we seem to be doing a little better this month, but we're still, we're still getting things wrong out there. And um, my ask to everybody on the call here is to try and increase the number of people that, uh, that attend these webinars. And so, if I, if a, a challenge to you all, if you can, the next time you come to this, to one of these, please bring somebody else. And uh, let's see if we can double the numbers and keep doubling the numbers. The more reach we can get out there to those people who um, need this information, the better chance we have of meeting our goals of uh, zero fatal accidents. So all, with that being said, I'll pass it back, um, pin back thy lug holes and um, listen and learn. Thank you. 
All right. Hey, thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, with uh, each uh, topic, uh, Chris Young is going to put up uh, some polling questions. So let's, uh, without further ado, let's uh, get into our first uh, topic. Um, yeah, Lee Roskop of our FA uh, Fleet Safety uh, Branch is going to present the Rotorcraft Monthly Accident Briefing. Uh, Chris or Ashton, Hello. can you pop up the, there we go. There we go, we got it up there. All right, so everybody in the audience, uh, feel free to uh, answer that question. Uh, since 1985, how many times has the U.S. had zero fatal helicopter accidents during the month of June? Got some options of never, one time, three times, or five times. Let that continue to build. Got about 66% participation so far. Uh, keep building, the people keep answering. We're about 79% right now. All right, we're kind of holding steady there. All right, let's uh, share those results. All right, the vast majority, 70% uh, said 70, or sorry, said never. All right, and the actual answer is, B, one time. And with that, Lee, we'll turn it over to you. Yes. So I thought that would be a good lead-in question since uh, we're, we're about to, uh, to wrap up the, uh, the month of May, uh, start transition to the, uh, to the summer months. And so it was just, it was interesting as I was looking back at the, at the data that um, in June is actually the, uh, the only month um, where we've only had one year where there were um, there were zero fatal accidents. Uh, every other month of the year has it had at least two years where we've had uh, we've had zero fatal accidents. So just kind of kind of interesting. And, and you know, you could anecdotally throw things out there like you know a change in um, and you know weather conditions, hotter temperatures, that that sort of thing. I you know maybe increased flying. I I don't know. There's uh, you know, I didn't didn't dig deep on uh, on the why behind that, but uh, it is interesting that June is the uh, is the only month that, uh, where there's only one year where that's happened. So getting into uh, the uh, the accident data for uh, for this month, uh, just starting out with uh, the uh, the USHST's uh, rate and where we're uh, where we're at in terms of measurement of the goal. So again, reminder: the USHST's uh, goal is for the, uh, the five year average fatal accident rate to be at 0.55 uh, or lower uh, per 100,000 flight hours by 2025, so into 2024. And you can see we're, uh, we're about um, two and a half years into that, uh, that five-year goal, so just shy of the, uh, of the halfway mark. Uh, now, going on to the right edge of the chart, uh, you see the dash line and where we're at for 2018 through um, the first, almost first five months of uh, 2022, we're at 0 0.78 per 100,000 uh, flight hours. So uh, not uh, not where we want to be in terms of getting to the 0.55 left uh, or 0.55 goal, but there is uh, there is you know time left uh, on that uh, that as well. So um, and you can obviously see the uh, the upward trajectory um, of the uh, the five year average fatal accident rate. So the um, you know if I'm I'm looking as an optimist for for good news here, this has flattened out a little bit from the last time I had an opportunity to. Uh, to speak to uh, to everyone, uh, just you know, so far uh, May has been a uh, been a positive month uh, for us, and uh, we, we hope that that, uh, that continues. Uh, you know, as Chris said at the outset, you know, that the uh, recommended practices and and risk management uh, continues to bear fruit in terms of uh, zero fatal accidents uh, through the remaining part of the month of May and, and into June, and maybe we can have to get our uh, our second June on the calendar with uh, with zero fatal accidents. Um, you know, since 1985. So this next chart uh, basically is a, a different presentation of uh, the same sort of information. Our, our baseline rate from 2014 to 2018, as you all may remember, is 0.62 per 100,000 flight hours over here on the far right. Um, 0.55 per 100,000 flight hours is the goal. And then these, uh, these in-between bars uh, represent uh, different metrics for different time frames. So first one, again, for uh, 18 through 2022, 20, uh, we saw we we're at 0.78. 
If we just look at the years that are going to count uh, towards our end 2020 to 2024 goal, uh, we have two and a half years that are factoring into that so far, and it's uh, 0.76 per 100,000 flight hours uh, current year, so 2022 only. So January through uh, almost all of uh, May, we're at 0.69. And then uh, May, again, um, no fatal accidents so far in, uh, in May. And one thing to point out um, on that is that we, we've had a fatal accident uh, every month of the, uh, of the calendar year. Uh, so far, so we're, we're looking whether it's whether it's May or June or whatever, uh, or hopefully consecutive um, months to uh, to break through with our first month uh, this calendar year without a fatal accident. Uh, this this chart just basically uh, tracks what the counts look like that uh, that feed into uh, into that rate. The blue line that you see depicted on there uh, uses our 2014 to uh, 2018 uh, baseline years for what uh, what the count looked like. Um, on average for, uh, for those, or the five-year average for those as you go month by month. Uh, you can see the green line is uh, 2022 uh, only, and we, uh, we got above that, uh, that baseline pretty early on in the year, but uh, at least as of right now, uh, it's, uh, it's flattened out. And the goal, of course, is for that count to be as low as possible. But uh, what we really would want is it for it to be no higher than this uh, 15 to 17. Um, Fatal accidents for the uh, for the calendar year, uh, assuming we uh, we fly about three million hours this year, which um, you know COVID years aside, uh, that had been about where we were. Uh, then that would uh, that would put us uh, closer to that rate of, of 0.55. So uh, this will just look at the single year rates uh, for uh, for each um, each one of the years. So again, the 0.69 we saw on one of the previous slides. You can see what's feeding into that uh, the 0 0.78 five-year average that we have right now. If you look at 2018 through uh, through 2022, all of them are pretty much in uh, in that ballpark. So we're we're looking to get back to uh, where we were uh, before that, which was was closer to um, where our our five-year uh, goal is supposed to be. Uh, Fatality rate. So we're looking at the, whereas the previous chart uh, was dealing with number of fatal accidents. This is dealing with um, you know occ occupants that were fatally injured. So a little bit of uh, of a decline so far in 2022. So um, not uh, not massive. Certainly not uh, not back to what we were looking at through the 2015 through 2017 timeframe. But uh, but again, I don't want to be overly pessimistic on this. I'll take good news uh, where there is some. So I. Right now, it is, uh, it is trending in a better direction uh, than it was uh, earlier in the year. And for the uh, fatal and non-fatal, so the overall uh, accident rate, right now, 3.43 per 100,000 flight hours. So looking back on our long history, obviously, if that would uh, persist through the end of the, uh, of the calendar year, that would, uh, that would be the best year that we had on record. Um, I will say, though, that uh, typically, we do see an increase in number of, of accidents over the uh, over the summer months. Certainly not hoping for that, but uh, just you know using uh, using past trends uh, that that may we may see that uh, that bump up a little bit as we get into the June July August timeframe. Hope that's not the case because it would be nice would be if, if we'd stay at that 3.43 or lower. Uh, now getting into uh, some of the industry specific data, uh, the uh, the fatal uh, accident rates uh, by industry sector. One of the things um, to point out here, you can see that we have a number of just one event um, for industry sector. And the only one that has more than that is instructional training. And the, the reason I wanted to talk about that for just a moment is if you go back to 2009, uh, we have had eight years where we've had either zero or one fatal accident in instructional training for the entire year. So it's, it's uncommon uh, for us to see two fatal accidents for instructional training um, for the entire year, uh, let alone for us to be not even quite five months into, uh, into the calendar year and for there to be two. Now, add to this that this helicopter or ambulance event, uh, now these categories are based on how the aircraft is, is typically operated. So this helicopter or ambulance event, it was not performing a helicopter or ambulance operation uh, during that fatal accident. It was doing a uh, instructional training evaluation type flight. So, you know, depending on how you wanted to, to parse this, you could say we're, you know, we were even at three uh, so far for this calendar year. So um, again, numbers are small enough that 
it's, it's not anything that I would say is necessarily a trend at this stage, but it is something to, to be aware of. And certainly, uh, you know, if you're um, an operator or in any, any uh, way associated with uh, instructional training uh, type operations of that industry, uh, just, just something to be aware of that we've seen so far uh, this, this calendar year. Uh, for overall accidents uh, by industry, uh, for those who are regular followers of this, personal private continues to uh, to be about a quarter of the uh, of the fatal accident or the, the overall uh, accidents. And you know, our top three categories historically have been personal, private, aerial application, instructional uh, training. And you see that um, instructional training and and uh, air ambulance are in that number three spot spot right now. For aerial application, um, as we get into the typical North American uh, growing season, we tend to see those, those accident numbers uh, climb this year so far has been no different. Um, of the seven overall accidents that you see up there for aerial application, five of those uh, happened during the month of, uh, of April and May. So just a quick rundown, I'm not going to go over these uh, word by word or in, in depth, but to give you an idea of those uh, eight fatal accidents that we have had uh, so far this year, the, uh, the two that were, uh, were in April, uh, the 429, the R22, and then a couple that were in March, the R44 and the, the 369, all these uh, Part 91 uh, operations. And then as we go, uh, back further to beginning of the calendar year, we, we pretty much have uh, every other uh, operation type uh, represented, whether 133 public aircraft, 137 or, or 135. Uh, so those are those are the eight uh, that we've had uh, so far this year. Again, you know from the previous uh, slides, spread out uh, largely among uh, a bunch of different industry sectors, other than stuff training. The uh, last thing that I wanted to uh, to talk about uh, for my my time is up is if you're a regular uh, receiver of distribution list of um, the FAA's monthly rotorcraft accident uh, briefing, we now have a uh, publicly uh, accessible uh, dashboard that has all that information on it that you can access at, at any time. And, and of course, it's, um, it's conveniently here for you to write down with the, uh, with the 225 characters <laughs> that, are on that, uh, that are on that link. Um, so th these slides will obviously be, be posted, so if you need to, to copy that down, um, but if you don't want to go that route, uh, HAI uh, makes it easy, uh, easier on all of us. Uh, just go to, uh, to rotor.org, and on that, their, their front page, you'll see the, uh, the safety uh, block there. If you click on that, and then the page will take you to shows latest safety reports, click on that. And then it'll take you uh, to a list of countries. Uh, you pick the United States, and there's one that says FAA Rotorcraft Accident uh, Dashboard, and uh, and you'll be there. So, you know, e either way, you can either go direct through that uh, the link that uh, that I provided on the previous slide, or maybe just as fast, if not faster, to uh, to go through HAI's uh, website to uh, to get there, and to give you an idea of uh, what will be on that uh, dashboard uh, when you uh, when you pull it up. For those who are, are longtime uh, receivers of um, the monthly accident briefing, uh, you see the same sort of thing, a breakdown. These are fiscal year uh, breakdowns um, by, by month. <laughs> of course, it's refreshing at the moment, so I'll give it a second to, uh, to catch up. But uh, some cool, uh, cool features that uh, our, our data scientists and Tableau experts have, uh, have put in here on the, uh, on the left margin that gives you an opportunity to look at how this tracks compared to the previous fiscal year, um, to the five-year average, that sort of thing. All the rate information is on there. Um, you know, month, monthly accident count also has uh, locations of where the accidents and fatal accidents have occurred, breakdowns by industry sector. And then uh, there's a second page here, this historical briefing tab. And as that, uh, as that pulls up, it will show you more of the, uh, the long-term uh, lookbacks of, uh, of the rates per 100,000 uh, flight hours. Uh, some some three year look backs for the counts for uh, for overall accidents and fatal accidents, um, and then you, as you as you move down through these uh, at the bottom of the second page, it has the USHST uh, data as well. So that's just another tool that uh, that we have out there uh, now for uh, for everyone to uh, to use. Uh, so please um, that that dashboard is is 
out there for everyone's information. And so you can track what trends and, and how those will uh, relate to your operations. And these were just in case the, uh, in case the website uh, didn't want to pull up just some screenshots. So thanks. I think uh, that wraps up my, uh, my time for this month and I'll, I'll pass it back to uh, Chris and James. Thanks, Lee. Hey. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Great. Yeah, next uh, topic, uh, if we can pull up the next set of questions, uh, maintenance human factors. James, real oh. quick, uh, sorry, yeah. just real quick. Uh, I did post the, uh, the link in the chat for everybody uh, to look at. And then there was one question we had, um, uh, Lee, uh, it said, uh, any ideas why 2018 was lowest? Number of operations lower question mark. Uh, why 2018 was the lowest number of operations? Well, the, 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 I think the, the, the number you gave was that, that 2018 was the lowest. And then the question is perhaps is it related to the number of operations? Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, all right. Um, so in terms of, uh, in terms of flight hours, if we measure, um, you know, operations that way, uh, no, uh, it, it's not. We, we did see a decline in flight hours pre COVID in, in 2019, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a massive decline. Um, you know, 2020 different, uh, different story. Um, you know, I think we were around uh, 2.4 million versus our three, three to 3.2 million uh, in, in 2020. So, uh, so no, um, you know, 2018 for whatever reason, uh, we had, we'd been kind of down in that, uh, that 0.5 to 0.6 uh, range for 15, 16, uh, 17, and then 2018, um, you know, we, we saw a, a spike um, and unfortunately it, it sort of stayed and plateaued there at, the, at that 0.8 for the last four or five um, years. It, one of the reasons that the USHSD went to a five-year average fatal accident rate versus just a year-to-year -year rate is because we did see that volatility sometimes uh, year in, year out, and, and we wouldn't necessarily be able to explain it. You know, you'd have years where you'd have two or three uh, solid years, and then you'd see a, see a spike. So we thought that, you know, pivoting to the, the five-year average would allow a, a more smoothing uh, effect for the data. Um, so that's that's why we uh, we went uh, to that. But I, I don't have, uh, you know, any uh, any gold nugget, I guess, uh, for, for 2018 to explain it. Uh, other than that, um, it wasn't a, a reduction in operations, though. Okay, great, Lee. Thanks so much. Hopefully, uh, that answers a question for Benjamin that submitted that question. And we do have the next uh, polling question up there: um, maintenance human factors, the dirty dozen. How important are the dirty dozen in, in the prevention of mishaps and accidents? Uh, we've got about sixty-eight percent that have uh, participated. Uh, let's go ahead, and we'll go ahead and share those. Uh, looks like we've got <laughs> the vast majority uh, that, that are saying it's very important, and that, that's a good sign. Uh, so uh, up next, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and intro introduce our next, uh, next presenter about the, the Dirty Dozen. Yeah, and then introduce uh, Bill Hopper from uh, Air Evac. Bill, you're up. Okay, thank you. Let me get, get the slide up here. We can see it. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay, very good. All right. Well, thank you, Chris and um, uh, United States Helicopter Safety Team for allowing me to speak today on maintenance human factors. As some of you may have heard me in the past, but uh, this is my passion. I really enjoy doing it. Uh, I have a very short time to get through this, so I'm going to get moving on it. We'll talk about um, one of the benefits of human factors training, and one it was very uh, Good to see that the majority, uh, was, I believe 94% thought it was very important. So that's, that's great. Um, then we're looking at the human factors to review the dirty dozen. Of course, there will be a summary of, uh, of what we have talked about today. One, well, first of all, um, how can this training today benefit you and what do you expect to get out of it? Uh, first thing is one, it, to increase my level of awareness for potential hazards. That's the key to this training is raising our level of awareness. Associate the dirty dozen with the uh, daily activities, uh, whether it be at work or at home. I uh, learned to slow down 
and lessen the chances for mistakes. And also to take the time to properly assess the job and its requirements. And also in performing maintenance, uh, seek help from experienced technicians when unsure of a task you've never done before. Of course, need to minimize distractions. Those are the number one factor in, in things getting missed on the job or distractions while conducting critical tasks. So what are the benefits of human factors training? Well, human factors training recognizes that human error is inevitable. We're gonna make mistakes, but there must be a system in place to counter those mistakes. Assist in the accurate identification of the underlying causes of an incident or a mishap. And also adopting a non-punitive approach uh, to these mistakes to error management using just culture. And also to improve human performance and help to reduce the risks and of course, reduce the frequency and consequences of human error by being able to recognize our limitations when they happen. So why is human factors important? It's one, to help raise our level of awareness. What is going on? Of the dirty dozen that we, we will cover today, we're simply gonna have to realize that all these dirty dozen are, are human limitations. And if we can address those human limitations and recognize those limitations, uh, when we're experiencing them will really help us a lot in preventing incidents and mishaps, as well as accidents. So review of the dirty dozen is we look at complacency, lack of knowledge, distraction, lack of teamwork, fatigue, lack of resources, pressure, lack of assertiveness, stress, lack of awareness, norms, and a lack of communication. We talk about complacency, and we looked at it as a self-satisfaction accompanied by a loss of awareness of the dangers, becoming comfortable. Uh, one of the things is that familiarity with something uh, breeds complacency. Overconfidence from repeated experience on a specific activity. Done it hundreds of times, and thus we get careless. When performing inspections and maintenance, expect to find errors, look for things. And of course, don't sign it if you didn't do it. In mitigating this risk is one, use a checklist in the performance of your duties. One, this gives an orderly flow to the job and don't sign off anything until it has been completed. Aggressively and regularly seek to upgrade your skills and knowledge level and act upon your gut, take your gut feelings, speak up when in doubt. Of course, never sign off on something you did not fully check and always double check your work as well as report all hazards that may affect the safety of others. And don't let familiarity with the situation lower your awareness. Lack of knowledge. All maintenance must be performed to standards specified in the manufacturer's instructions. And the question that can be answered is why? Why must we follow these instructions? And if you don't follow those instructions and something does happen, you have to ask yourself two questions is one, can I defend what I did or can I defend what I did not do? Technicians must be sure to use the latest applicable data and follow each step of the procedure as outlined in the data. And then of course, follow checklists, very important. Never make assumptions or work from memory. It's also important for technicians to obtain training on different types of aircraft in their systems. And also do not be afraid to consult more experienced technicians or technical reps when in doubt. It's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. Also lack of on the job experience and specific knowledge can lead to misjudging situations and making unsafe decisions. The aircraft systems are very complex today and nearly impossible to perform these tasks with substantial technical training. Systems and procedures can change significantly and have so over time and knowledge can quickly become out of date. And I put this photo of uh, Albert Einstein on here. It says, if you, cannot, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Them to referring to the aircraft or systems. Mitigating the risk, be sure to listen closely to instructions given to complete a task. If you're unsure of those instructions that are given to you, ask for them to be repeated. Only fix parts and perform maintenance on parts or aircraft you are trained to maintain. 
Also ensure the maintenance menu you are using is up to date. If you do not know how to perform the task, then refer either to the current maintenance menu or seek a more experienced technician to help. Distractions, number one. A distraction while performing maintenance may interrupt the procedure and it is possible the technician may skip over a detail that needs attention. Now this distraction can be either a phone call, it can be someone coming up with a very benign conversation discussing what you have going on the, the coming weekend. But anything that takes your mind away from the job is a distraction. This could result from a phone call. We all realize that all it takes is one phone call to change our entire day. It could be difficult family or financial matters or other personal issues that may occupy a technician's thought process. So bringing your issues from home into work or from, take your issues from work into home. It could be anything that takes your mind off the task that is being done. Distraction examples are phone calls while driving, work-related issues, family-related issues, financial challenges, fatigue, health-related issues, getting a bad review at work, not receiving a pay increase over a period of time, you feel underappreciated on the job, and then you don't get along with the boss. Mitigating the risk of distractions. When you're distracted, go back at least three steps in the work procedure. Also use some and a coworker to help ensure no steps were missed in the procedure. Have that second set of eyes. Also use a detailed checklist. This is the third time I've mentioned a checklist and that's how important they are to use. And sign off each step only after the job is completed. Marker tag incomplete work when pulled away from the job. And of course, never leave tools or parts lying around. Secure them before leaving the area. And place them back in your box at the end of the day in a shadow box, and so you can put you give, you give each tool its home in the toolbox. Immediately lock wire or safety or fastener when required. At an instructor in EMP school, you can say torque and safety as you go. Take care of the torquing immediately and lock and safety wire. Don't expect to go back to it and complete the task because you may be pulled off that task and then it's not going to be, be the job's not going to be completed. And also take a phone call later. Okay, lack of teamwork involves the sharing of knowledge between technicians. You know, no one corners the market on knowledge, and the sharing of that knowledge only makes our industry better. Lack of teamwork could result from turning work over from one shift to another, having a pass down, either a verbal pass down or a written pass down or both. And sometimes I have to be careful with this because on a verbal pass down, if an oncoming uh, technician does, doesn't like the outgoing technician, there's going to be very little information passed. And from this situation, you can turn a, a personal issue into a safety issue. It also involves everyone understanding and agreeing on the action to be taken on that shift. So everyone knows at the beginning of the day exactly what their task will be. And one thing to keep in mind, that remember that whoever you're working for, you are a team. And when one team member fails, the entire team fails. Mitigating those risks, ensure the lines of communication are open between personnel. Discuss specific duties when jobs require more than one person to eliminate any questions. Ensure that there are always opportunities for questions and clarification. Technicians should feel they have, uh, they don't, there shouldn't be any reason why they shouldn't have, be able to ask anyone for some advice. Be clear about individual expectations and concerns. And of course, always look out for coworkers with safety in mind. Fatigue, this is a big one. Fatigue is insidious. It can sneak up on us at any time. In fact, for example, I had the benefit of listening to a presentation where the presenter said that when the body is tired, it will go to sleep. It doesn't matter what you put in it. And we've all had that situation when we're driving when we get very tired, particularly this night and it's dark. Next thing you know, we're, we're jerking our head up and we can't remember the last five miles. We've been driving, staying on the road. Our eyes were open, but we've been asleep. Fatigue can affect our ability to concentrate, remember, and make good decisions. It can also make us easily distracted. And we, at that point, we lose situational awareness. It affects our mood. 
Your mic is either withdrawn from others or become irrational and angry. There's a human problem leading us to underestimate our level of fatigue. So if it's an attempt to push through and overestimate our ability to cope with it. It also can be managed by getting regular sleep on a healthy diet and exercise. It's a major human factor. It's contributed to many maintenance errors resulting in accidents, incidents, and mishaps, not only from a maintenance standpoint, but also from an operational standpoint. Fatigue can be a physical, mental, or emotional. Physical fatigue means that you physically can't do what you could do if you were rested. Mental fatigue may manifest itself as sleepiness or slowness. Emotional fatigue could be the loss of the death of a member in the family, a divorce, or a sick family member. Symptoms of fatigue, short-term memory problems, you channel your concentration on unimportant issues. You neglect important factors, you're easily distracted. You have a normal mood swings, increase in mistakes. If you're working and you're making more mistakes than normal, I think what you'll find out is you're tired. You make poor decisions or even no decisions. It could result in lowering your own personal standards to accomplish a task. Our standards are the line in the sand and we simply do not want to cross that line at any time in our career. The cause of fatigue, primary lack of sleep, stress-related events, working too many hours, working alone when fatigue is dangerous, it can affect our circadian rhythms. And countering, countering, countering the effects could be difficult. The person typically is unaware of these effects unless pointed out by someone else or something happens. Mitigating the risk, be aware of the symptoms and look for them in yourself. Well, for a complex task, you know if you're exhausted, the best remedy is to get enough sleep. Technician must be aware of the amount and quality of sleep. And use of caffeine, pseudopedrin, and amphetamines will be effective for short periods of time, but fatigue will still exist. And also check to see if prescribed medications may be making you tired. Lack of resources. Resources include personnel, time, data, tools, skills, knowledge, and experience. It also can interfere with one's ability to complete a task due to lack of supply and support. Be proactive and, for the, and reduce this chance of lack of resources affecting you by checking suspected areas or tasks that may require parts at the beginning of the inspection. And also keep in mind the right tool for the job needs to be used at all times. Use of the proper technical documentation is necessary to troubleshoot or repair a system. And the proper resources resources, save time and money, and there's a higher probability the job will be done more efficient the first time. Mitigating the risk, maintain a sufficient supply of parts and order any anticipated parts before they're required. Never replace a part with one that is not compatible for the sake of getting the job done. Preserve all equipment and treat it like you own it. Pressure, maintenance tasks require individuals to perform in an environment with constant pressure to do things better and faster without making mistakes. And that's a pretty tall order. Pressure affects the capabilities of the maintenance worker. Financial guidelines and tight schedules in an organization require technicians to identify and repair mechanical issues quickly. But keep in mind that sacrificing quality and safety for the sake of time should not be tolerated or even accepted. It's to be expected when working in a dynamic environment Sometimes too many deadlines can affect our ability to complete a task correctly, but however, it should not reduce the quality of the work. The pressure can also come from our inability to cope with the situation. It also can be self-induced by taking on more work than we can then handle. And there's also going to be false assumptions of what is expected of us. And again, the risk, ensure pressure is not self-induced. Communicate, 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 communicate. If you need more time to complete a repair, ask for help if you need it, and recognize when that time pressure starts to cloud your judgment. And by all means, have one check your work. Lack of assertiveness is the ability to express our feelings, opinions, beliefs, and needs in a positive, productive manner. It's important for technicians to be assertive when it pertains to aviation repairs. It either is right or is not right. Direct result of not being assertive or speaking up could ultimately cost a company a great deal of money or people's lives. Mitigating the risk, provide a clear feedback on the risk or dangers perceived. Never compromise your standards and provide your opinions and remain open to accept constructive criticism. Stress, this is a big one. Acute stress arises from real-time demands, such as an emergency or working under time pressure with inadequate resources. 
Chronic stress is over a period of time. It's accumulated stress, such as long-term events, such as finances or bereavement. The factors that affect our level of performance under stress include skill level, our pers own personality, the confidence in the job we have we're doing, or the complexity of the task. Types of stressors, there's physical stressors. There's also psychological stressors, as well as physiological stressors. And physically, it affects us. And emotionally, it also affects us as well. Mitigating the risk, if you do not manage stress, it will manage you. Stop burning up emotional energy. Look rationally at the problem, difficult but doable. But listen to the issue using your rational mind, not your emotional mind. Lack of awareness, defined as a failure to recognize all the consequences of an action or lack of foresight. Performing a task repeatedly can cause a technician to become less vigilant and develop a lack of awareness, which ties in with complacency. Each time a task is performed, it must be as if it were the first time and have someone else take a look at your work to see if they can spot a problem you may have overlooked. And again, the risk, always ask coworkers to check your work, have another set of eyes. Even if you're highly proficient, always have someone check your work. It doesn't matter how many times you've done a job, you can make a mistake. Be aware of how fatigue may affect you and also how distractions may affect you as well. Norms, short or normal for the way things are normally done. There are unwritten rules that are followed or tolerated by most organizations. If positive norms can contribute or reinforce established safety standards that the company has, has. And negative norms can detract from those safety standards and are contributors to accidents. Then we look at unsafe norms that are non-productive, such as taking shortcuts in aircraft maintenance, working from memory, not following the procedures and signing off incomplete maintenance tasks. And when taking shortcuts, indicating when you sign off that work that it was completed, you did it in accordance with the manufacturer's maintenance manual, and you took a shortcut in it, then you have to think about what you're really signing for. But again, the risk, ensure that everyone follows the same standard. Be aware that just because it seems normal does not make it correct. And sometimes the easiest way of accomplishing something may not be the standard. And the key to remember is just because you've always done it that way does not necessarily make it the right way. Lack of communication. Described as a failure to transmit, receive, or provide enough information to complete a task. Never assume anything. If unsure, ask the question. Typically, people remember the first and last part of what's said. And whenever transmitted instructions may be unclear, ask to have them repeated. Don't assume. The receiver may make assumptions about the meaning of those instructions, and the transmitter may assume that the message has been received and understood. Basic requirements for communication are the sender. The source sends a message that may be conveyed in words or pictures. The method by which the message was sent, cell phone, written. Of course, the message must be received. The receiver must provide a response and feedback indicating the message was received and understood. Mitigating the risk, develop good communication skills, both as a sender and a receiver. Good communication is a skill. The only way to, to improve a skill is to practice it daily. Properly use law books when maintenance is performed and worksheets to communicate what work was accomplished. Aircraft log books should tell a story. Ensure that the maintenance personnel are discussing exactly what needs to be accomplished during the maintenance process and use a checklist. Of course, never assume that any work has been completed by someone else. In summary here, the word safety as used in aviation is heard often, but not necessarily practiced for many different reasons. The FAA and many of the aviation alphabet groups, such as AOPA and the USHST, continue to promote aviation safety on a regular basis. Safety in aviation is an attitude. It's a way of life. Safety should be kept in mind when planning an operation, preparing for the operation, conducting the operation, and closing out the operation. If you've ever been involved in an incident or accident and look back at the cause, you'll find that many of the dirty dozen were present. Many times all 12 were there. There are times when incidents and accidents repeat themselves. And the question is why? Why do the same events keep happening over 
and over again. The Dirty Dozen originated in 1993, approximately 29 years ago, and their relevance continues today. Even after several years of human factors training, many of the Dirty Dozen are often forgotten. This is because there's not been a connection with their relevance and the person. By this I mean, in cases in my in presentations in the past, I'd ask a group, that I know a year before had human factors training with the dirty dozen. I asked how many can remember at least five and nobody in the room could remember them. And the best way to remember them is to take, think about, take all the dirty dozen, each of them, and think about how these affected you in the past. When was I complacent? When was I distracted? When was I fatigued? And when you can draw a relationship to those words, then you'll remember them. In aviation, we are all ambassadors for safety. Working in an unsafe manner on a daily basis can only lead to problems down the road. If a person is operating in an unsafe manner, and that person is aware that he or she is operating in an unsafe manner, then the situation is like rolling the dice, where in time an accident will occur. And that's all I have for today. Thank you for attending today. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill. Excellent uh, presentation. Um, I had to remember a few of those myself. So uh, yeah, great, great feedback or a reminder. So Chris, do you have anything real quick? I, I don't. I, I don't see any questions from uh, our attendees, but uh, definitely, Bill, thank you again. I, I know you're a, a subject matter expert when it comes to the dirty dozen and appreciate your time. I know, I know that was a little rush to cover all 12 and, and the time that you had allotted, but uh, really appreciate that. Um, it's a significant element to, to succeeding if, if, if all of us can remember those, those dirty dozen and, and, and practice uh, how we can control and, and, and be more uh, driving more positive results. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, there is one question in our uh, Q&A. Is there a handout for the Dirty Dozen or access through the FA website? Um, I think this presentation is going to also be uh, put up on the USHST website. So, um, well, looks like uh, the question got answered. So um, with that, uh, let's uh, move on to our next item, uh, risk management, uh, a formula for avoiding Disaster uh, by Kip, and uh, here comes the next uh, polling question. Chris, to you. All right, thank you. Hey, Bill, real quick, if you could stop sharing your screen for us. All right, I'm, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Sorry about that. There you go. All right, yeah, we've got our next question up there. Uh, can pilots learn lessons from accidents and other modes of transportation? Yeah, folks. Contributing right now are about 71%. Other modes of transportation, lessons learned from other industry sectors can help us. Okay, why don't we go ahead and share that? We're about 80%. And overwhelmingly, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we've got some really smart folks out there, Kip, uh, that, that believe that other modes of transportation can help. We'll, uh, we'll kick in uh, to your presentation now. Okay, awesome. So I guess I'll go ahead and share my screen. So everybody's got the presentation up? Yep, we can see that, thank you. Awesome, so that was a bit of a softball of a question. So I'm glad that everybody got it right. So, um, and so that kind of leads into my presentation. So again, thanks for uh, having me and I'm uh, you know, really honored to be able to present to the USHST All Hands uh, webinar. So, the subject, uh, risk management, a formula for avoiding um, disaster, is actually a kind of a compilation of two of my articles I do write for AIN. And um, I have a safety and airmanship uh, blog that is published on the third um, Friday of every month. So I have one that's due actually today um, that I'm working on. So, and it'll be published on Friday. But I'll go ahead and uh, start with the presentation. Ooh. Hold on. Let 
We lost your screen share. Okay, I'm coming back. Sorry about that. Yeah, for some reason, it's hung up and won't share. <laughs> okay. Um, you can you unshare me somehow and I just start again? Well, it, 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 you're not sharing currently, so just click on that share screen at the bottom. I did, but it's kind of frozen. Stand by. Okay. There we go. All right, what's the presentation without a little uh, technical issue? There, is that better? Yeah, we got it back. Okay, and I'll try to go from the presentation mode, but that didn't seem to work so well. And I noticed that Bill had had his up in the okay. uh, kind of standard mode. This, does this work for everybody? Yeah, that's great, thank you, Kip. Okay, sure. So anyways, again, um, the topic is a risk management formula for um, avoiding a disaster and just a really quick um, intro. Um, I'm a pilot. I'm not a helicopter pilot, but I did work with the USHST kind of in the formative years um, for about eight or so years. I'm um, doing, I was a system and equipment um, working group lead and worked a lot with Chris doing some presentations on SMS and such. So um, I am a fixed wing pilot. Um, as I mentioned, I do write. Um, I wrote for ProPilot for a number of years and I've been writing for AIN for the past uh, five or six years. Um, I have no idea how many articles I've actually written, but it's over around 300 or so. And I do some consulting on the side as far as uh, safety and training programs and then some avionics stuff. So the agenda today, and so I'm actually going to hit most of the presentation without even a picture of an aircraft, which is kind of unusual for one of these uh, presentations. So um, the agenda, so the formula for avoiding disaster, um, it kind of from a recent article, kind of like a primer on SMS, um, it was entitled Don't Swim with Sharks. So I uh, will talk a little bit about um, some definitions and such and kind of level, to level set the discussion. And then I'll go into a um, another topic of avoiding um, disaster, and it's the lessons from the sea. And so that was actually taken from the Annapolis um, um, book on sailing. Um, it's been in public. It's been published for over thirty-five years, I guess, and is constantly updated. But it's, so essentially, I use that formula and, uh, and adapt it to a helico recent helicopter crash. So first of all, the first section, don't swim with sharks. Um, so I'm sure everybody has seen JAWS. And so I'll frame um, this discussion using JAWS, which was um, you know, a movie in the 1970s that was well before SMS was even thought of. But um, for those of you who have seen it, it actually is a good, um, nice discussion as far as um, how to, you know, what's a hazard, uh, what's a risk, production versus protection, uh, risk assessments and then risk mitigation. Um, they're all kind of boiled up in that movie. Um, and so if you rewatch it, it's a really, really good movie. Um, if you think about risk management and um, weighing production versus uh, protection. So first of all, hazard versus risk. Um, so these are terms that are often um, kind of um, not used correctly when you read things. And so a hazard simply is something that can potentially cause harm. Um, so if you think of a shark out swimming alone, it's a hazard. Um, and until you actually go swimming next to the shark, it doesn't become a risk. And so I like to think of this as, um, if you think in aviation terms, um, you know, flying in low IFR is a hazard, but you know, if you're gonna fly into IMC, then that becomes the risk. So if you remove the verb um, from any of those conversations, it's a good way to remove the risk. And so if you think of managing risk in aviation, if there's a uh, hazard that's been identified, um, you try to mitigate it to uh, reduce that level of um, risk. 
So again, the gentleman on the left is um, uh, Chief Brody. And so he was the chief um, of police in Amity, which was the fictitious town on Long Island, which was the backdrop for um, Jaws. And so he was, if you think of his role, um, he's there to serve and protect as the police chief. And um, if you remember the beginning of Jaws started with um, Chrissy Watkins, who was a college age um, female who went skinny, skinny dipping um, at nighttime on the beach and ended up getting um, attacked by a shark and died. So, and then the mayor on the other hand, um, he isn't more on the production side in that um, it was weeks before the season opened for the tourist season. And so he's looking at um, if there is this threat of shark attacks that it's not gonna go well for the city. And so, whereas Chief Brody ruled um, Chrissy Watkins' death, death as a shark attack, Mayor Vaughn kind of downplayed it a little bit and then ultimately chose to um, describe it as a, uh, that she was struck by a boat. And so his primary interest at the time was to keep the city open for business. Um, so again, like some basic aviation terms, um, it's a balance. So too much protection uh, will lead to bankruptcy and then too much production um, can lead to catastrophe. And so if you think of, you know, a simple race risk matrix, um, obviously if you look at the likelihood and severity of a shark attack, especially one of the great white um, shark, you know, so extremely harmful for sure. So that's a, in Chief Brody's term, it was an intoler intolerable risk, whereas, um, you know, Mayor Vaughn downplayed it and tried to um, uh, manage the risk by just avoiding it. So anyway, so risk mitigation. So the idea to lower the risk is to um, implement some type of a control. Um, so uh, Mayor Vaughn, essentially, at first, um, his approach was to just post signs of, you know, beware of sharks and stuff like that, whereas um, Chief Brody essentially just wanted to get rid of the risk and get, eliminate the shark. So um, when you go to mitigate risk, um, so this was, if you think of signage on the hierarchy of risk mitigation. So that's essentially an administrative control. So that's way down on their list of effectiveness. Um, so that's what Mayor Vaughn attempted to do. Um, so that's what the they initially did. They did an administrative control trying to manage the risk of a shark attack by putting signs. But then shortly after those signs went up, a young eight-year-old was attacked by the shark in um, broad daylight. And so he died. And so then Chief Brody, then he launched into his epic um, battle against the shark to eliminate the risk. So again, this was just kind of a conversation just to think of um, how to manage risk and or eliminate the risk. And so Brody um, actually um, went out and eliminated the hazard by taking out the shark in some dramatic fashion. So um, again, you know, so the greatest way to eliminate um, or to manage risk is to eliminate the hazard. Um, so again, just to recap, a risk requires a verb or an action word prior to the hazard, such as swimming with sharks, flying in icing conditions, flying a circling maneuver, um, and then a hazard and threat um, are often interchangeable. So turbulence or icing um, can be a hazard or a threat, low visibility, search, circling approach procedures, et cetera. And then uh, a hazard and a risk um, aren't necessarily interchangeable. Um, but to eliminate the hazard um, or threat, then you, if there's no risk, so you can't have a risk as the outcome if you eliminate the hazard or the risk. All right, so now we're going to go into our next um, section. And so this is um, the formula for avoiding disaster. And this is the meat of the topic. So this is again um, comes from um, the lessons from the seas pieces, the Annapolis Book of Seamanship. And so it outlines the formula for disaster with eight um, contributing factors found in most marine accidents. So a single factor on its own, just like in aviation, uh, may not be chalked up or 
may be chalked up to an opportunity to learn, but the accumulation of several factors may ultimately lead to an um, to a disaster. So these things are accumulative, and um, but again, it's we'll go into it. So lessons from the sea. So seamanship and airmanship. So there are some parallels. Both of them do involve um, the art or mastery of uh, operating a vessel, and each involve a highly specialized skill set. So each also requires good handling skills and a thorough knowledge of weather, navigation, communications, mechanics, uh, rules and regulations. And without this foundational um, knowledge, the captain of a yacht or aircraft um, can find themselves in peril. In their peril. Again, you know, so it's just the linking a chain of errors. So for the aviator, um, this is an uh, um, uncommon concept. So we're used to reading accident reports of how things build up and how those can lead to disaster. So the, we're gonna look here at a high profile helicopter crash. And so this is the Sikorsky S-76A um, model that crashed in Southern California and killed Kobe Bryant. So there's been a lot written and talked about that, but um, it actually aligns with seven of the eight um, formulas for disasters as um, portrayed in the Annapolis Book of Seamanship. So the number one piece is a rushed um, or ill-considered departure. So time pressures, whether real or perceived, are powerful and can cloud judgment. So often delaying a departure um, is the safest bet. And so the NTSB and the Kobe Bryant uh, crash um, cited self-induced pressure by the pilot to complete the flight as a likely contributing uh, cause. And then had they waited for the fog to lift um, by delaying the start of that youth basketball game, um, it would have been a much better outcome rather than flying into uh, deteriorating weather. So then the next point is the route is inherently risky. So choosing the wrong, wrong route may be risky. So on a boat, if you're too close to the shore, it might include hazards such as narrow channels, unpredictable currents or shallow water, while too far out may expose your crew to higher winds. So on an aircraft, the wrong route can be also to prove to be deadly. Uh, flying too low in areas of rising terrain and foggy conditions um, are contributed to many accidents and also contribute to to the Kobe Bryant accident. Um, the route has no alternate. So in planning passages, sailors like aviators consider um, intermediate destinations or alternates uh, where they can seek res refuge um, for when conditions do deteriorate. So contributing to the Kobe Bryant crash was a complete lack of preparation or a plan. Um, so there was very little uh, weather checked um, prior to the accident. They went, continued to just press on. And once the weather began to worsen, the pilot continued to fly under VM, uh, VFR uh, rules into instru instrument meteorological conditions. So in this case, um, the pilot could have sought refuge by landing um, at an alternate, such as a soccer field or some other safe place. And this goes way back to um, HAIs, um, just land the damn helicopter or whatever the t-shirts said at the time, but the USAGST supports um, not continuing flight into IMC and with the helicopter you can, um, you have the, you can land uh, essentially anywhere. Uh, the crew is unprepared, so the skills and capability of the crew may vary, so each crew must know their own personal limitations. Uh, the pilot and the Kobe Bryant crash uh, continued flight into IMC, even though uh, he lacked proficiency flying on instruments and wasn't qualified to fly the S-76 in IMC. Uh, the boat or vessel or helicopter is unprepared, so the vessel must be suitable for its mission. As an example, some boats aren't suitable to sail long distances in open waters. Likewise, some aircraft aren't suited or aren't suitable or certified to fly in IMC conditions. So the operator of the helicopter um, that killed Kobe Bryant um, was only authorized to fly under VFR conditions. They weren't certified or trained to fly IMC. And the aircraft that was equipped with an autopilot, so highly capable aircraft. However, the NTSB um, never was able to determine whether that uh, equipment was operable on the aircraft. 
Uh, regarding other safety equipment, um, the accident aircraft also was not equipped with TAWs um, or voice or cockpit or battery recorders. Uh, leadership is poor, so this is another uh, element uh, for a recipe of disaster. So on a boat, the crew looks to the skipper for leadership. Uh, most of you guys in the helicopter community fly single pilot. So the pilot must rely on other resources um, for support. So in the case of Kobe Bryant's crash, uh, the NTSB cited organizational shortcomings and pointed to the operator's inadequate view and oversight of its safety management processes. So they didn't use flight risk assessment tools or really the SMS was a, simply a book on the shelf, um, but wasn't effective. Um, so this is what my son calls the boomer slide, but it is the excessive faith in electronics. So this is where automation dependency is a concern in all modes of transportation. Uh, so for nowadays, from uh, automobiles all the way up to you know jet airliners. So specific to boats, um, they also find that an over-reliance on electronics can result in a, a degradation of basic seamanship skills. And so we see that in aviation uh, where we see automation uh, degrades manual flying skills. Um, this one isn't applicable to the Kobe Bryant um, crash. However, there was another fairly high profile accident in the Bahamas in July of 2019 with an Augusta Westwind uh, 139. Um, it was owned by a, a coal billionaire. And so essentially relatively new aircraft to them uh, flown by two pilots um, and neither of them really were um, super competent or qualified to fly at night. And so the, the setup of the accident was the billionaire's daughter um, and a friend got sick on a, in the Bahamas and they were gonna fly them, airlift them back to um, Florida with the uh, 139. And so it was a call at nighttime. And so they ended up basically uh, flying uh, visual approach over dark water um, or actually it was on takeoff. So when they went to take off over the dark water, the uh, flight crew lost control of the aircraft and crashed um, without any visual references. So, but the pressure of um, transporting, you know, the boss's daughter is really what set them up for disaster in that case. So you can put all of these into um, like the essentially four main buckets as far as how you classified the formulas for disasters and how to prepare to prevent that. So um, these are the basic four rules of preparation. So they include uh, prepare the boat or aircraft, prepare the crew, choose the safest route, and then prepare for emergencies. So translated into aviation, um, you could just say that you would, ideally you'd shoot for the highest level of equipage on your aircraft, and then the highest level of training for each pilot that flies that aircraft. And then to manage all of this, organizations would support that operation with a functional SMS um, and the appropriate risk assessments. Any questions at this point? Okay, so I'll just continue on. So these are the, the wrap up takeaway slides and um, I went really, really quick, but I can share this slide deck with uh, Chris and company. So the takeaway, um, one of the things that wasn't used in the Kobe Bryant crash was a flight risk assessment tool. And so they're super effective. How USHST promotes it. Uh, MBAA in the fixed wing world promotes it. Um, and then the point I would like to make is that um, a lot of uh, flight risk assessment tools and SMS processes, you're always, they're trying to manage the risk to go. Whereas um, starting at a position of no uh, might be more appropriate in many cases. So single pilot risk management, this is uh, from the MBAA, but you know, it's applicable to fixed and rotor craft um, in that they've improved that single pilot axle rate as, was a top safety focus area for the MBAA. And so they say that the single pilot operations have en enhanced risk when compared to multi-pilot operations, um, as demonstrated by the fact that single pilot aircraft are 30% more likely to be involved in an accident than an aircraft with dual pilot crews. So single pilot operations are more susceptible to task sa saturation and when task saturation increases, so does the number of errors. So trying to man manage those in a single pilot um, thing up front is super important. And so you can manage that by 
using tools such as flight risk assessment tools. Um, there's a free guide from the MBAA on their website. It's the risk management guide for light business aircraft. So it's applicable to helicopters and uh, fixed wing airplanes. But it's a super good primer on risk management fundamentals, um, such as identifying, assessing, and mitigating risk. And it provides this easy to use flight risk assessment tool and kind of guides you through how to use it. Um, I won't go into deep detail here, but we'll uh, just touch on it briefly. Um, but most importantly, this guide demonstrates that um, the principles of safety management systems are scalable and it can fit the needs of many small operators by keeping it, you know, starting simple. Um, and the SMS is truly scalable for smaller operators because most of the, I believe the stat that the HAI publishes, 80% of all helicopter operators have five aircraft or less. So, um, and that's the sweet spot of um, like this guide touches on. So identifying the risk via flight risk assessment tool. So the mindset, um, I guess ideally you develop a mindset kind of like a go-no-go no go decision, um, which is more ex, uh, acceptable to the single pilot than attempting to mitigate a risk to an acceptable level. Um, this is especially true when multiple risks are ident identified for a single flight. Um, so that's where, as you're doing a flight risk assessment, uh, it's probably appropriate once you start um, seeing all these factors begin to line up that uh, things are becoming a higher risk. It, that's where you probably call a timeout and maybe not even do the flight. Uh, so the MBAA's flight risk assessment tool is based on identifying and assessing risk in the following categories. So that it looks at qualifications, currency, proficiency. Those two things are different. Aeromedical, human factors, the aircraft, so equipage, whether it's appropriate for that particular flight. Um, environment, including weather, ATC, and terrain, and then external pressures, um, such as um, human factors type stuff or pressures or work, et cetera. Uh, so we're coming up towards the end. Um, we'll end up right on time, I hope. But so it's a position of go um, versus no. So this is a big concern, like at least that I've seen is uh, with any risk assessment ex ex exercise within an SMS is that it often, come, often comes from that position of go. So from the start, an operator they take these heroic measures to try to mitigate the risks so that they can actually go fly um, to that lowest acceptable level uh, to complete the mission rather than just discontinue the operation. So looking back at Kobe Bryant's case, had they done a, a flight risk assessment tool, once they saw that the weather would be deteriorating, then you know, just call a timeout and just wait for the, you know, that morning fog to lift um, or cancel the flight or do something different. Um, so the more appropriate response might be to adopt that position of no. So once a risk other than low is identified, implement a safety, safety timeout, as I said, seek out other resources and find the safest solution that could include delaying, canceling, and modifying, or even finding an alternate or alternative to that flight. Um, so that is it. Um, any questions? Um, hey, Kip, thank you. Uh, there is one question, but it, it's related to Lee's uh, okay. um, presentation. We'll hold that answer till the end, but I don't see anything else right now. Do you, uh, James? Uh, I don't see anything either. Um, yeah, and I know Lee's uh, working on a, a response to Jessica's uh, question there. So, okay, cool. um, yeah, so, yeah, thank you very much, um, Kip. That was excellent. Excellent. So, okay. so sorry um, tech yeah, next, uh, oh, no, no worries. It, it happens to, to all of us. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you, next Kip. up. Oh, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, I appreciate Kip's input, you know, and his metaphor with Jaws and, and, and relating to that, I think is really helpful for a lot of people. And on the risk assessment, it's, you know, it's really important, especially for single, single pilot, small owners, uh, or small, uh, operations, uh, private owners, it's really important to, to have a process to help you understand what your risks you may be faced with and understand whether or not it's actually prudent to, to go out on that flight. Yeah, it makes us all think about uh, uh, other things to think about uh, before we hop in the cockpit and take off. So, but with that, uh, next we have Robert and Jonathan up on the GA survey overview. Uh, Chris, you want to 
or Ashton get the polling questions going. Okay, that's up there now. On average, how many hours did each US-based helicopter fly in 2020? And the options are about 200, about 250, about 300, or about 350. We'll let those responses come in. We're about 20, 30% right now. About 65% now. All right, we'll go ahead and put that up. And it uh, looks like the, the majority were about 250 and that actually is the uh, right answer. So uh, good on you if you pick 250. Jonathan, would you like to, to start? Yes, yes, I can I can get going here. Um, so I have a, uh, a slide deck that I can can share here. Let me pull that up, um, and then we can can get going. Great, thank you. And we can see it. All right, perfect. Let me just put it into uh, slide mode here, and we should be able to get going. So you can all still see the. Uh, you see the notes page now or the actual presentation? John, uh, looks like we're in presenter mode so we can see your next slide in the notes. Okay, let me, um, there we go. And this is what we want. All right, perfect. Is that better? Everyone yep, can see yep, that there you go. and hear me as well? All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, what, uh, what we're here to talk to you briefly today is um, the results of the, the 2020, 2020 GA in Part 135 uh, survey, specifically obviously around the, the helicopter results and the rotorcraft results. Um, give a brief overview of the survey and then take any questions um, as well. So really the, the topics that we're hoping to cover here for, for these uh, 10 or so slides First, we're going to quickly run over, you know, what what the GA survey is and the data that are produced through the through the GA survey itself. Next, we're going to talk about how those survey data are used, uh, why the, the participation of rotorcraft is so crucial to the overall estimates, as well as obviously the the estimates of the rotorcraft rotorcraft activity. Uh, how we actively try to reduce the participant burden um, throughout the survey process, and then how we also protect the protect the data confidentiality so that we can ensure that those responses are, are kept confidential um, so that nothing is, is, is reported except in, uh, in aggregate terms. So in terms of the, the survey data that are available, so we, we provide uh, a lot of estimates um, with differing characteristics. So we provide estimates of, of current year data that have fleet sizes, that have the flight hours of the, uh, of the fleet and the rotorcraft fleet the types of flying that is done or that are done through the different uh, use categories that, that folks report flying, the fuel consumption. So there's fuel consumption estimates across different types of fuel, as well as different types of aircraft, as well as estimates of landings and avionics equipage throughout the fleet. And all of these estimates are also cross-classified by aircraft type, um, region, the, the year of manufacture of the, of the aircraft, as well as the, the primary use category of those aircraft. Um, and then within those, those reports, we also do provide some 10 year look back. So we'll provide trends um, across the past 10 years for, for aircraft types or, or specific cross classifications. Um, we provide make model estimates as well as air cargo only estimates. And then we also sometimes um, provide special analyses um, of specific geographies or specific use categories, or sometimes a, a combination of those two, uh, of those two characteristics um, when they are, are of interest to specific folks. But overall, it is the, uh, the primary source of data for the, the GA fleet and also the, uh, the rotorcraft fleet in terms of the uh, activity and the characteristics of the overall fleet size. So how are these the survey data used at the end of the day? So they're used uh, in a handful of ways across industry and across uh, government. So they're used obviously for the, the, the fatal accident rate, right? The, it provides the, the exposure for that rate. Um, it's used to, to forecast the size uh, and activity of the fleet. 
So there's a, a, a branch in FAA that, that provides a 30-year forecast. So the GA survey data results uh, feed directly into that for that 30-year forecast and, and trend. It's also used to assess uh, the economic impact of aviation um, and I'll also for projecting future needs for infrastructure for the national airspace. And then lastly, um, understanding the, the impacts of potential policy. Um, so things like uh, fuel and, and related taxes um, related to fuel and aviation fuel, avionics equipment, so rates of specific equipage, ADSB comes to mind recently, um, the rates of, of actual equipage there. So that data is also all contained within the, within the survey and we produce those, those results um, for, for interested parties throughout the government. We also do conduct um, special analyses when, when folks um, request those. Those come through the FAA then to us, but those are also um, provided then to, to researchers or uh, members of the press or anyone that's interested in, in specific analyses when we, when we are capable and we have the data in-house. So this comes to, to the point of, of why the rotorcraft participation is so critical in, in these results, right? So there are a few, uh, a few different use categories where rotorcraft really do account for the majority of hours um, in, in the total estimates for the entire general aviation fleet. So air medical comes to mind, right? Air tours, aerial observations. Those hours are heavily concentrated among the rotorcraft fleet. Uh, and overall, the, the rotorcraft, the no, total number of rotorcraft is less than 5% of the GA fleet, but they actually record about 20% of the total hours in, in a year. So there's a disproportionate impact there uh, among the rotorcraft of, of really providing a lot more hours than um, one would expect for the number of, of rotorcraft there are. So getting that data to the, uh, to the survey itself is really critical to ensuring that those estimates are accurate um, and really do provide a good snapshot of the, of the rotorcraft community. Uh, we do break out the activity uh, across two different engine types. So we have we have piston rotorcraft, and then we provide estimates of single and multi-engine uh, turbine rotorcraft. So we break, the, break those out across three different types of aircraft by the two different engine types. And one last note here. So since 2004, we have actually surveyed uh, every single rotorcraft in the population. So each year, we take a, a full 100% sample of every single rotorcraft in the in the uh, United States and attempt to get survey data from, from all of them. So it's roughly uh, 11,000, I wanna say 500 this year, uh, rotorcraft that we are trying to, to get survey data from. And it's been that, been that way since 2004. So some results from the, uh, from the past year, um, these, these provide information actually since 2016. Uh, so trend lines across those use, those major use categories where rotorcraft do um, provide a decent number of hours or usually the vast majority of hours. So air medical, air tours, um, the part 135 air taxi. You can see, and this is probably unsurprising, uh, that in 2020, most of these took a, took a dip. Uh, air tours, the first one in the upper left is, is probably the, the largest or the worst hit of the, of the use categories. Um, it uh, obviously suffered a lot in 2020 with the pandemic. Um, the air tour industry didn't, didn't have anyone essentially to, to take tours. So it makes sense that these uh, numbers plummeted so much for, for air tours. Uh, air medical also took a, uh, a slight turn downwards, um, not as, as steep as the air tours activity, but again, these are all somewhat expected, I would think from the, uh, from the pandemic. And they also somewhat, mirror, also somewhat mirrored the overall GA data for the, for the full fleet. Activity was down across the fleet, regardless of, uh, of aircraft type. Um, which again, I think is, is probably something that is, is expected uh, with the with the US HST group. Part 135 air taxi, a uh, bit down, again, logical response to, to the pandemic. And then aerial observations uh, in the bottom right here. So we do break these out by, uh, by rotorcraft and then provide a, another line that is either fixed wing piston or the fixed wing turboprops or turbojets. So those are typically the the next highest contributing uh, aircraft type for those individual categories, just to give some, some context there. Any questions about these slides before we can move on to the next one? All right. 
In terms of the, the survey response rate, um, so we provide this here spec through 2012. So you can see we have a, uh, a pretty consistent overall response rate that's that dashed line in the middle there. So typically in a year um, of the, the surveys that we send out, we usually get somewhere between uh, 45 to, to 42, 43-ish percent of the surveys back in-house. Um, so that's our, our overall response rate. The interesting thing here, and this has been very consistent, as you can see, since, since 2012, uh, actually going back further as well, the, is the difference in the, the type of rotorcraft for the response rate. So that top blue line are the turbine rotorcraft. And those have, have consistently reported data at higher rates than the piston rotorcraft, which are that bottom green line. Um, and it, it's been this way um, for, for many, many years. And we have tried and worked and tried to figure out how to, to better reach the piston rotorcraft community or trying to figure out why this could be potentially. And we are unsure. I mean, we have some, some ideas of what could potentially be causing the, the lower response rate among the piston rotorcraft community, but we have not found a way to, to essentially to, to increase that or to get it closer to the overall response rate or that, uh, that turbine rotorcraft rate. Um, so that's, that's one, of the, the one of the things that we could use some help with through the uh, USHST. If there are any ideas about why that could be um, or any ways or suggestions that you all have uh, ways to reach the piston rotorcraft community uh, at a better in a better better rate that would be appreciated because again we've, we've been trying to solve this for many years um, and it's still it stayed relatively consistently uh, spread between the the two types of, of rotorcraft. In terms of um, efforts that we make to reduce participant burden, um, there are a handful of ways that we go about that. So we, we coordinate with the FAA um, in the HAA survey. So that is a uh, required survey of all the uh, helicopter air ambulance operators. Um, so they're required to provide their Part 135 or medical data to the FAA. Um, so we try to coordinate with the FAA and, and reach out to those fleets to see if we can get permission to use that data that was already provided uh, through that HAA survey for the purposes of the GA survey so that those folks and those operators aren't filling out uh, a second survey with essentially the same data. So we do that uh, each year and then we get the permission of those fleets and use that data for, for a large number of the HAA operators. Um, one, one small issue with this is it does cover only the air medical portion. It's usually the vast majority of the hours um, that these operators are flying, you know, upwards of 95%. Um, but we are leaving some, some hours out there that we, that we don't have accounted for. Uh, the other, other way that we reduce the participant burden is through an abbreviated survey form. So instead of asking a, uh, a large fleet to fill out a detailed survey form for each one of their individual aircraft, what we'll do is we'll send a, an abbreviated form that kind of aggregates or ask them to aggregate their data by major aircraft types. So by their turbine rotorcraft or by their piston rotorcraft. And we ask them to tell us, you know, how many of these rotorcraft do you own? How many did you fly? Uh, what were the total hours flown for your fleet? What were the total landings? What was the total fuel consumption? And everything is reported at that aggregate level. So they aren't, they aren't filling out, you know, 15, 20, 30, 80, individual surveys, but just one survey form in aggregate for their entire operation. So that really does reduce the burden. And it's something that, that we should, or that we're pretty comfortable, uh, most operators can fill out in, in 15 to 20 minutes um, if, they, if they have the, uh, the data on hand for their operations. And lastly, um, we actually actively seek out and, and try to contact fleets throughout the, uh, throughout the GA community and the, and the rotorcraft community. So we have um, a survey lab in-house that we, we try to contact fleets through email, through calling. Uh, we have a 1-800 lab that's, or 1-800 line that is listed on every single mailing that goes out. Um, so folks can call us, operators can call us with their data. We'll take the information over the phone. There's a, uh, a web survey that folks can fill out online on their own time. So there's really not, not a limit to how the data can be sent to us or transmitted to us. Sometimes it gets sent through email. Um, but that's that's the third way that we really try to do try to reduce the burden. Again, we'll we will take information across the phone, um, and we do actively actively call individual fleets trying to to set up that information sharing.
And then how, how do we make sure that we protect the, protect the confidentiality of the data? You know, this is something we realize that uh, a lot of fleets are, are suspect of, of providing their data because that is their own data that potentially contains uh, information that they don't want their competitors to know, right? So again, we only ask for data that's highly aggregated. Once we, re we receive that data, we actually aggregate it to a higher level all of our estimates are, are reported at aggregate levels. So we report for an entire fleet of turbine rotorcraft or the entire fleet of piston rotorcraft. Anytime that there are not enough survey responses to support a single estimate, we will suppress that. So we don't print that if there are only a handful of cases um, that we can actually use data for to, to provide an estimate, we will just not print that uh, within our within our survey estimates itself. So we don't we don't reveal any information there. You know, if there's a, a specific type of fleet in a specific specific area of the country that does a specific type of flying, and everyone knows that, oh, this fleet only does this here, this data must refer to them, we would not report that, we would suppress that information. So that, that's one way we go about uh, protecting the confidentiality. Uh, and the second, the second way we do that is all the data is stored in-house here, um, so it never leaves our facility. We, we destroy any the, the paper surveys after the completion of the survey year, and we restrict the, um, the results in the, the analysis files and the raw survey data to just the survey team that is in-house here in our office. So the data never actually leaves here, never gets transferred to a third party. Uh, it actually never, the raw data itself never gets transferred to the, to the FAA either. It's all housed and contained here on site. So we do publish annual estimates uh, at the end of each each survey year we provide estimates for that survey year so the most recent one is 2020 but they are available each year going back through 1999 online um, so there's the website down there for you if you want to access those this is just a, a snapshot of one of the one of the tables these are the overall estimates for the uh for the rotorcraft community in 2020 so our most recent survey uh, our current survey, the 2021 GA survey, is currently ongoing. Um, we're about halfway through the field period. So if you have received mail uh, or a phone call about it and have not completed it, I urge you to do so. Um, the information right, that we provided in the previous slide is, uh, is how you can get in touch with us to provide us that information. Uh, so email, phone call, uh, or you can also reach out to, to me or to Peg uh, directly and we can, we can help get that information in-house. Uh, other than that, uh, we can take questions if there are some. I think there might be some in the chat or the, the Q&A there. Um, there are other resources here that we document. So there's an appendix that provides the, the methods for the, the survey itself, as well as the, the data, various data collection materials that we use to, to gather data throughout the, the survey year. Those are all posted, uh, posted online. Thanks, Jonathan. Hey, could you post those links in the, in the chat to for everyone after uh, we're done uh, with the yep. Q&A here. I will do that. Okay. And uh, I do see one question, um, but it might be for for Lee, <laughs> but it, it, the question is, is there a difference in statistics of piston versus the uh, turbine aircraft as it relates to accidents? I don't, I don't know, Jonathan, if you guys track that or, or Lee, you've got any information on that. So we, we do not track, I mean, we provide the, um, I can go back to, let me go back a few slides. We do provide the information at different level, but we don't track the, the accident rates, but uh, we do provide the, the hours for piston rotorcraft versus the, uh, the turbine rotorcraft. So that could be, uh, could be calculated. I'm not sure if it is, if it is different though, I'll leave that to, uh, to Lee or, or somebody else to yeah. chime in. Yeah, it, it is, uh, it's higher, Chris. Um, you know, I, if the, person wants more specific numbers, they can, they can contact me, but it, it is higher. The, the piston is higher than the turbine. Okay, thanks, uh, Lee, appreciate that. Um, and uh, Jonathan, you had a, uh, a question or a comment from Jessica directly to you to reach out to her. I will do that. Okay, and, and Jessica, we will answer your question uh, at the end of that you put in there earlier. Okay. Yep, I don't see anything else. Thank you very much, Jonathan, excellent. 
Thank you. Yeah. And please, uh, participants, please, please answer that survey. Tell all your friends, <laughs> your coworkers, or your, anyone that uh, should be participating to do so. All right. Our uh, next up, we have uh, Tuan and uh, Nicole from uh, Leading Edge Flight Academy, uh, flight operations in high, hot environments. Um, Chris, you want to pull up the polling question? All right, we we've go. got that up there now. What is the highest altitude you've landed a helicopter at? Uh, the options are below 5,000, between 5,000 and 10,000 feet, or above 10,000. And those responses are coming in now, about 45% uh, have responded. Looks like uh, we're holding steady about 65% of responses. All right, why don't we go ahead and post those. And uh, the majority were between 5,000 and 10,000 feet. All righty. Awesome. Well, Nicole, I hope you can give them give them guidance. <laughs> yeah, looks like we've got some good uh, good answers out there. Let me get my presentation pulled up here. All right, can everyone see that on my screen? There, I'll try the presenter, the present mode as well. Can everyone see that full screen? There? Got it. Awesome. Cool. Um, hi everyone. Thanks for having me this afternoon. Um, I work at Leading Edge Flight Academy here in uh, Bend, Oregon. Um, I've got some fun helicopter pictures throughout my presentation to help keep um, some of the attention here. Um, I got this photo of the Long Ranger I was flying on a LIDAR contract a few years ago. And that's Mount Shasta in the background. So definitely operating at some high density altitudes down there. Um, in addition to managing the flight school, I work for a charter department as an instructor and a line pilot there as well. So. Um, that's my background. And yeah, today we're just going to do a short overview on operations in high and hot environments, especially it's a really good topic to just review, especially this time of year, as all these temperatures start to increase for everyone. I know up here today, um, we're already at, we're going to get up to 80 degrees uh, this afternoon. So um, we'll talk about that. Uh, most of my flight time is in Robinson R-22s and R-44s, so power management and flying at high altitudes is something that we do quite a bit. Uh, we're based at 3,500 feet here in Bend and uh, up in Oregon and Northwest. During the summer, we'll have days, you know, if it gets up over 100, we're taking off at 7,000 feet density altitude with students uh, at, you know, in the R-22 at max gross weight, so um, got a lot of high terrain around us as well that we work and train in. Um, so to start off, I just wanted to go over uh, just a basic overview of what density altitude is. Um, what's really what we need to pay attention to the higher and the hotter it gets. Um, so the most basic definition of density altitude is our pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. So we correct based on the pressure system that's moving through the area, whether it's a high or low pressure system to find our pressure altitude. And then we use temperature to find what our density altitude is going to be. So another way to think about density altitude is it's the altitude that the helicopter thinks it's flying at. So regardless of what your altimeter is telling you, um, the helicopter is going to perform aerodynamically based on the density altitude here. So we have um, three major effects of density altitude. And the first one, like I talked about pressure. So that's going to naturally increase at higher elevations. And then also, as I mentioned, with different pressure systems moving through, if you have a high pressure system, that's going to be a little bit more dense there. And a lower pressure system is going to reduce that or increase your density altitude there. Uh, the next biggest factor and probably the largest factor is the uh, temperature. So as I mentioned, we're getting into these warmer days. And as you can see in this little depiction here, if you've got cold, dry air, lower density altitude versus standard versus this warm, moist air that's going to expand. Moisture does also have an effect on density altitude, um, but it's pretty small. Um, if you run your uh, computer, your flight computer, and figure out what density altitude using um, just the pressure altitude or the altimeter setting and the temperature for the day, 
and then you listen to the AWOS and you're, you know, 30 to 100 to a couple hundred feet off, that's where that difference is coming from is that AWOS or weather reporting system is going to compensate for that moisture. And um, it's pretty small though. So we don't really need to spend too much time talking about that. Um, for an example here, I just got a standard density altitude chart um, over here. So let's just say we're at on a standard day at sea level, the altimeter setting 2992, 15 degrees Celsius, your altimeter reads zero at sea level, and that's what your density altitude is, you are at zero. But if you're at that same sea level airport, zero indicated on your altimeter, and we'll use 2992 so we keep our pressure altitude the same, let's say today it's uh, 30 degrees outside. So really hot for the coast or wherever sea level you might be at. You're gonna start at 30 degrees on this chart here. You're gonna run up to your sea level and then you're gonna go come across and you're gonna see that your uh, density altitude, even though your altimeter shows zero, your uh, density altitude is almost 2000 feet. So rather than that zero, you're actually starting at about 2000 feet for the helicopter. So it's already going to um, affect your performance. So now that we kind of understand what density altitude actually is, uh, let's talk about um, why that change affects the performance of the helicopter. Um, there's an R44 for you <laughs> on the desert. Um, so aircraft performance is going to be your biggest factor here. And there's two reasons for that. First of all, your engine is already going to be producing less power. So let's say you live in a low altitude environment and you come out to the Cascades that we have out here, you're out in Colorado and you go for a hike and you're a few thousand feet above where you normally go for a walk or workout, your performance is gonna be much less based on the less air that you have available to you. And so that's the exact same thing that's happening um, for your engine and then also aerodynamically for the blades. Um, so, you know, you're gonna be more breathless be like, man, I feel so out of shape up here. Um, your engine's thinking the exact same thing when it's operating at these higher altitudes. Uh, second part is gonna be the actual aerodynamics of the blades. So um, I'm kind of a nerd, I love the lift equation. So if we come back to the lift equation here, the amount of lift that our blades are actually able to produce does rely on air density. So given the same pitch angle, uh, the same rotor RPM, you're not changing the size of the rotor blade very much, uh, you have that air density factor in there. And even though it seems kind of small, that is gonna affect the amount of lift you produce. So for the same pitch angle on your blades, you know, you're getting the same bite of air, um, you're not with a lower air density at a higher density altitude, uh, that overall lift that you're producing is gonna be much less. So you're gonna need more power uh, to maintain a hover or to maintain flight or airspeed at that uh, given pressure or density altitude. Um, it's important to remember that that's not just the main rotor blades, that is going to affect your tail rotor blades as well. Everyone talks about the wind directions affecting uh, tail rotor effectiveness, but it's super important to remember high and hot um, uh, environments for your tail rotor. Um, the Robinsons, they do really, really well. Um, however, that's not to say you should ignore it. Um, the 206 is very susceptible to this. Um, I haven't flown many other helicopters, but I'm sure um, other people can speak to that. Um, but your tail rotor is also producing less thrust, um, which means that for that same power setting, you're going to need more left pedal or more power pedal, whichever helicopter you're flying, to maintain um, directional control. So um, one way uh, that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later is to get into an out of ground effect hover and not just check for your actual performance to land at a spot in terms of power or temperature that you have available, um, but also looking at um, how much pedal, how much power pedal you're gonna be able to use. Um, there's a good 206 picture for you, Jet Ranger. We got the uh, Van Horn blades on our tail rotors to help um, help overcome that. Um, so that's uh, about the performance. So now let's talk about what you actually need to pay attention to as a pilot. Um, so first of all, uh, using your hover in and out of ground effect charts, 
making sure you should already be checking these, but especially as these temperatures increase or you go to fly in more mountainous terrain, you definitely want to double check these. Uh, most of us should be pretty familiar with using these, but I use a simple R22 um, uh, ground effect chart for this example. You're at 6,000 feet and on a standard day, maybe it's zero degrees outside on a cold winter day, you can hover at that altitude and that temperature at 1,365 pounds. Seems light for some of the bigger helicopters, but that's just five pounds under the max growth. So you can get up there fully loaded, um, shouldn't have any issues um, at that landing spot. Now, if you take that same landing spot and it's 30 degrees outside, you're only able to land at 1,340 pounds. 25 pounds doesn't sound like a lot for the larger helicopters, but those of you who are flying the smaller ones, you know this is what gets you into trouble. You know, it's a lot warmer out, you've got full fuel, maybe you're with a student trying to drop something off, uh, been in and out of the spot a million times before, it's no big deal. But if you didn't check your out of ground effect or your uh, hover performance, you might not be able to get in there with the power that you have available. So you really got to think about some different options there. Are you going to burn some fuel off? That's 25 minutes of fuel in an R22 at a standard fuel burn. So you're gonna go burn some extra fuel, uh, maybe take off with less fuel, remove some baggage, find a lower spot to go land, um, that type of stuff. Um, in addition to, um, I wanted to look at a more complicated uh, uh, hover chart here. And this one is for the Bell 206. And you definitely wanna make sure that you're checking any notes on the chart. For example, in the 206, you've got area A versus area B for different wind configurations. Then you've also got notes if you know it's during the winter using anti-ice, uh, your uh, hover is gonna be 220 pounds less. That's quite a bit the whole person. Um, so definitely pay attention to those small notes there. Um, for uh, some safety considerations when you're using this and doing your performance planning for the day, um, first of all, is to use an out of ground effect hover chart. Um, unless you know where you're going is going to be a flat concrete pad or a taxiway or a runway, you're not guaranteed the full benefit of ground effect. So you definitely want to use your out of ground effect hover chart. Um, you know, dusty, snowy, grassy landing areas. Um, it's much safer to plan on that out of ground effect uh, hover. Um, Another thing to consider is the size of your area. Um, just because you can get in does not mean you're gonna be able to get back out. So making sure that you do have enough room to maybe get some airspeed before popping up, um, making sure that you just have enough room um, to uh, get out of those spots once you do land on them. Um, another buffer you can use is, uh, I use a 500 foot rule. So if I'm planning on landing at 6,000 feet, I'll run the chart at 6,500 feet. That gives me any inaccuracies to the spot I'm landing at, any um, extra weight maybe that I didn't account for, just gives you a little bit of a safety um, in your mind there as you watch that spot. Uh, there's a good snowy landing area up in the mountains. Uh, cold day, but still um, upwards of 7,000 feet. Don't stay altitude on that one. Um, let's see, last spot. Uh, last thing about uh, performance here. Well, let me go back to this. Uh, out of ground effect for a second. Um, as you're coming into a landing spot, um, one of these ways that you can confirm that your ground effect that you calculated is going to work, you have enough power, and that you have enough pedal to get into that spot is going to be pulling into an outer ground effect hover. I recommend at least 200 feet above your spot. So you come into your spot, you kind of know where the winds are coming from. You come in and you hover over that, that spot at a couple hundred feet. This way, if you start to run out of pedal, that nose starts turning, you can nose forward, lose a little bit of altitude to get ETL and get out of that LP if that's if you ran out of pedal. And you can check your power. Am I at 100%, 200 feet above my spot? Then I can probably go into my spot. Am I not able to slow down enough and arrest my descent rate? Probably don't have enough power. So it's one of those last minute checks um, when you get to that spot to confirm that you do have that power before landing there. Um, so I like that check. I know a lot of people use that. Um, so especially as it's starting to warm up in these confined areas, do that uh, out of ground effect cover check before committing to your spot. Um, the last piece on aircraft performance that I wanted to touch on, I've got a, 
rush kind of through the last couple slides here. Um, if you are a flight school, this is definitely geared towards you. Um, our auto rotation practice is the biggest lead to overspeeds and downtime for our aircraft. Um, so something that you got to think about with these increased uh, temperatures and density altitudes is that increase in true airspeed. Just because you're indicating 70 knots doesn't mean that that's what your true airspeed is. So you have so much more energy going into these auto rotation flares that leads to a way faster, um, way faster increase uh, and decrease of those rotor RPMs. You've also got less lift, you got less drag, so those rotor RPMs move faster. Now you tie that with a five to 10 knot increase in true airspeed, that's really going to increase that energy as you're coming in there. Um, so definitely recommend instructors, if it's hot, it's a lot higher DA than what you've been flying, do the first auto for your student uh, or instructor pilots anywhere in the industry, do that first auto feel out the conditions, those up and down drafts that are gonna affect your rotor RPM, and then also um, just how much energy you're gonna get uh, as you're coming into that flare. Maybe slow down five to 10 knots, depending on the density altitude that you're gonna be flying in. Uh, the last piece here that I wanted to touch on um, is the pilot. Do not forget about the pilot when you're talking about hot environments. Um, it's really easy to get into heat stress um, environments as these temperatures increase. So just those quick few reminders here, stay hydrated, not only just water, but also electrolyte drinks a couple times throughout the day. Um, get into shade when you're not flying to help keep you cool. Um, a lot of pilots I know end up with sunspots and uh, uh, skin cancer on cheeks and your nose. So make sure you're wearing that sunscreen as well. And my little trick is, or my personal uh, thing is fuel yourself when you're fueling the helicopter. So when you land to get fuel, take a quick sip of water, take a handful of snacks or whatever you can get um, and just keep yourself fueled throughout the day so that you can prevent uh, this heat stress. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Kind of had to go through that quickly. I didn't realize how long that was gonna take. So um, appreciate the time for everyone. Uh, today and just a reminder of those key takeaways, increase safety margins, give yourself more room than you're used to, really double check those performance planning numbers, use that outer ground effect cover before committing to your landing, and then keep yourself as a, a pilot hydrated. Um, thanks again for the time today and uh, I will uh, exit out of here and be around if there's any questions afterwards. Oh. Excellent, Nicole. Hopefully get out. It is a gorgeous state today down here in Central Oregon. So, Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you guys moving my time slot back. I just got from Medford. I had a quick flight in the 407 that I had to go do, so I was glad to be able to get that in and still come present with you guys. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Appreciate it. I, I, I did see a comment from Nick Mayhew in regards to um, the USHST safety bulletin on density altitude. It's in the, on the website. So encourage everyone to, to go and check that out. And honestly, that was a great refresher for me. It's been a while since, since I've been in those charts. Uh, so I hope everyone who participated today got, got a lot out of that. that you know, the, the, the details are important and, um, when you don't have a lot of margin. So thank you, Nicole, for doing that. That was a great review. Um, let's, uh, I don't know if Lee, if you're able to, to jump on again to answer Jessica's question um, on that. Uh, let's see, I'll just read it. Uh, regarding the three sectors of the industry that have the highest accident numbers, personal, private, instructional training and aero application, arguably all involving a high number of pilots with lower time or lower experience. I'm curious about the team's perspective on whether or not we are seeing those accident rates as a direct result of low time pilots, or we can identify inherent risks within those sectors that are unrelated to a lack of experience. Is there any additional data to support either? Thanks. Uh, no, that's a, a very insightful question by, uh, by Jessica. So. In terms of the hours uh, piece, so what becomes difficult with this is 
from the NTSB's data, we can get the um, the hours for for accident pilots, you know, and it's sometimes available in terms of you know total time, rotorcraft time, make model time. Sometimes it's only available for uh, you know for one or two of those kind of uh, kind of parameters, but we can get it from the from the NTSB reports. The problem becomes uh, we don't know how to um, how to baseline that against uh, what what are the hours for the non-accident pilots. So you know, in a in a given year or a series of years, you know, what what are non-accident uh, pilots flying in a year? So with with sort of that gap, you know, we can say, yeah, the accident pilots are you know have have this amount of hours, whether you consider that low, high, or in between. But we can't make that judgment on whether it's really low comparatively if we don't know what everyone else is flying. If that if that makes if that makes sense, we're only getting kind of a snapshot of the uh, the accident pilot um, set of data. So um, what we did a few years ago, 2014, uh, we put together a comparative report that looked at the uh, the data on uh, accident pilots uh, for for rotorcraft, and that's in the repository USHST's repository section of the uh, website. And you'll see a comparative report, Volume One and Volume Two. Volume One is higher level. Volume Two really gets uh, deeper in the weeds. But that's that's what we've looked at. In the past on those. Um, kind of to the heart of the of the question though, I think there are some some inherent uh, risk areas that we've seen from some of our past um, you know deep level analysis. So personal private it tends to be a little more uh, all over the map. Um, you know unintended IMC is is represented as a as a higher risk uh, for for that particular industry sector. We also see um, the um, Loss control type events from exceeding operating uh, limitations, and also putting the helicopter in a uh, an adverse uh, aerodynamic situation, more so in the personal private uh, industry sector for those accidents. Now, for uh, instructional training, and, and Nicole talked about this a little bit uh, in her presentation in terms of increasing safety margins. The big one we see on that is a failure of the instructor to intervene in a timely manner, and the helicopter gets to a, a point where it's, uh, it's it's not recoverable. Now, as I mentioned in my portion of the uh, of today's talk, um, the majority of those tend to be non-fatal uh, accidents. And so, you know, it'd be it's an auto rotation that doesn't work out at the bottom, or you know, a, a dynamic rollover or something during during uh, practice hover operations. Those those sorts of things. Um, the the last category that tends to be our high accident category is aerial application, and that one. And I've talked about this, I think, in some of our previous uh, USHSD all hands. Uh, obstacle strikes are, are the big one uh, on that. And we, we saw that again in 2021, uh, wire strikes more so than a lot of the uh, a lot of the other obstacle strikes, but you know, from, from wires, poles, other things that you can hit at, uh, at low altitude. And um, a big portion of that is just exposure to that uh, to that environment. And you're flying back and forth, back and forth across the field. At low altitudes, and um, you know we've had I think some of our um, some friends in the mosquito control uh, industry talk in the past about specific altitude parameters that they they uh, established to uh, you know kind of put some guardrails and and, um, and barriers against uh, you know hitting wires and obstacles at, at low altitude. So that's sort of a, a high level um, answer to to Jessica's uh, question that hopefully uh, hopefully gets you know captures most of what she was asking. Thanks, Lee. Now, all good points. And yeah, we've had opportunities during past webinars to specifically talk about those risks that uh, each of those sectors encounter. Um, encourage everyone to go back and, and check out some of the older videos. Um, but it also points to the fact that depending on the mission type that you are flying the, that day or in general for your operation, how important it is to, to take the time to analyze the risk exposures that you might have. And prior to going out and flying, look at what mitigations, risk controls can you, you can put in place ahead of time so that exposure is reduced. So it's critical to, to really understand what the hazards and those risks are before you, you get out there. Yeah, most definitely, well said. Well, uh, we are nearing the end here. Um, uh, just a, another uh, plug for our, our 56 seconds to live. Um, Tim Tucker just let me know that we've got another, another video coming out here shortly. Uh, uh, getting 
going to get posted tomorrow uh, on the website, on Facebook and uh, YouTube. It's the 56 Seconds to Live. Uh, re, uh, I think it's Rebound. Or, uh, and so I encourage you to get out there and, and check it out. And really important uh, to, to see all of that um, and take, take the time to, uh, to do these classes, uh, web, um, uh, resources that are on the website for you to, to look at. Um, we, we want you to join uh, uh, the USHST effort. So please go to the website and, and the, the starting point is to follow us and then uh, we can get you connected to specific uh, working groups that, that we have, um, the focals, uh, the helicopter safety enhancement uh, can work with the focals on those, but you got to get involved. We need your help to, to, to make this make this work for our industry and reduce the, the likelihood of these accidents. Uh, we, as, as was said earlier, uh, every accident is our accident. So we need you, need you out there. Nick, did you have any uh, closing remarks, James? I don't think Karen is on. Um, no, just to say thank you to all the presenters. Uh, fantastic stuff there. Uh, and some good reminders on uh, things that we need to keep thinking about. Um, uh, just to reiterate what I said at the beginning, you know, the, the people who normally come to these webinars and listen to the uh, old people like us talking about things that we've got wrong um, um, are normally the people who are already doing all these things. So my challenge you again is to uh, next time we, we put on one of these webinars, please find somebody else to bring with you maybe who hasn't seen this and, uh, and we can start increasing the numbers and uh, reducing the risk of, of accidents. That's all I have. I just want to say uh, have a great Memorial Day weekend um, and uh, please keep it in the green out there. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. James, yeah, you have I have nothing else. Okay. No, I have nothing else. Uh, thank you, everyone. And yeah, fly safe uh, for the long weekend. Be safe out there. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next uh, either July or August for the next webinar. Thank you, everybody.